Family, what's going on? Once again, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're not subscribed, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I really, really appreciate it. As I always say, y'all could have been anywhere in the world, but the fact that you come and rock with me, I really appreciate it. So thank you again. This is a sermon that I just preached recently. And this one is at the Alpha Street Baptist Church. So I currently serve as the uh, young adult pastor there and uh, was asked to preach um, on this particular Sunday. It's the Sunday after Easter. So in light of that, I wanted to uh, preach a passage uh, that was kind of in line with the calendar. Um, so Easter just happened. And so then we have these post-resurrection appearances. And uh, it's crazy. Because even in all of this, I was posted, uh, a clip of the sermon was posted by Glorilla, you know, my fellow Memphian. It kind of went crazy, went viral. So I'm really excited about, I was really excited about that. At the time uh, of me recording this, it's like at 2 million views. So it's pretty, pretty dope. Uh, but a lot of people didn't see the whole thing. And so, yeah. I'm excited about this sermon. This particular sermon comes from the aspects of it that come from a very, very personal place. And uh, yeah, so check this out. It's called What They Got to Do With Me uh, from John 21. Let's jump right into it. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I'll try it one more time. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Give me some. I got one more in me and I got to go, but. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Anybody got a reason to lift them up today? Anybody got reason to say hallelujah today? Anybody got a reason to say thank you, Jesus, today? Lift up the name of Jesus. Yeah. Lord, we thank you that you are an awesome God. Lord, there's so many things that we could thank you for. But, but Lord, if there's one thing, if we ain't got nothing else to thank you for, we can thank you that the tomb is empty. Because the tomb is empty, it's legitimate for us to ask, why do you cry? We can lift up our heads because you got up from the grave. We thank you. But now, Lord, it is preaching time. I know that I can't do this without you, only through you. Praying you would saturate my spirit and allow your word to go forth in a mighty way where your people will be held. And we'll be sure to give you all praise, glory, and honor. It is your darling son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do me a favor. Look to somebody to the left or the right and say, I'm so happy to be sitting next to you. Yeah. Now raise your hand if you told a lie in church. Yeah, raise your hand. To... To our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley and his after. Come on, give God praise for him. I want to thank him publicly for allowing me to come and to stand where he stands every Sunday and proclaims the word of God. Uh, people don't have to be kind. And when they're kind, they don't have to be kind to you. And I'm, and I'm thankful uh, just to be here Today, I had a friend, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, uh, I talked to him this week and told me uh, his father passed unexpectedly. 
And uh, I came to church this morning in a different type of way. Uh, where I'm from, there's an old country song we were singing uh, that said, uh, we thank you for one more sunny day. And, and I'm just happy for one more uh, sunny day. I don't want to hold y'all too long. I know brunch is on your mind. Um, let's go to a familiar passage of scripture. John chapter 21. I love you, Jesus. I worship and just want that I love you more than I love I worship and just want that I love you Come on, lift it up. We headed to the word. I love Jesus. I worship and just want to tell you that I love you. That's why I praise you, I lift you up, and I'm mad, yeah, come on, I know you know it, I know it's old school, but y'all mind going back, that's why. Yeah, come on, sing it like you mean it, I love you, it's simple, I love, yeah, I love you, Lord. Why? Because, because you care for me. in such a special way. That's why I, pray. I lift you up I lift you and I'm. You stepped in right on time, that's why. When I was left alone, Jesus, you brought me along, that's why. Yeah. Last time. Oh, that's why. That's why. That's why. Well, John 21, John chapter 21, I'll be coming from the Christian Standard Bible. When you find it, say amen. amen. Reads of this wise, I want to do a little reading here. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way, Simon Peter, Thomas called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing, shout nothing. And when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus calls to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did. 
They were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. And when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. <laughs> Bring some of the fish you just caught. And Jesus told them, so Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And even though there were so many, the net was not torn. <laughs> Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus then took bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. If y'all don't mind, for a brief amount of time, I want to tag this text, what that got to do with me? What that got to do with me? You may be seated. What? <clears throat> what that got to do with me? Yeah. One of the more beloved films in the history of America it's the Wizard of Oz. There's an interesting conversation that occurs between Dorothy and Scarecrow. It goes something like this. Dorothy says, are you doing that on purpose or can't you make up your mind? Scarecrow says, that's the trouble. I can't make up my mind. I haven't got a brain, just straw. Dorothy then asks, how can you talk if you haven't got a brain? Scarecrow said, I don't know, but some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> that Scarecrow is truly on to something, because people without brains seem to do an awful amount of talking. But when we lead into this conversation a bit closer, something jumps out at us, doesn't it? Because how can one with no brain even formulate sentences without the presence of the mind? And logically, one with no brain can't make a profound statement without having one. It, it doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, it's called a non sequitur. The words non sequitur are Latin words that mean do, does not follow. That a non sequitur is when a, is a statement where the conclusion just does not logically follow given the premise. As a matter of fact, have you ever been talking to someone and you made a statement and their response had nothing to do with what you just said? <laughs> Growing up in my household, it happened all the time because my mother was in the house with three boys and her husband, and oftentimes we like to watch basketball or watch something on TV, and she would bust in on our party and had to always give us some information that we didn't know what she was talking about. Potentially, oh, that furniture just went on sale, and then typically we would respond with something that had nothing to do with the furniture, and mama in her own way would always say things like, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? <laughs> it's a non sequitur that when the statement has nothing to do with what was previously stated, so it seemingly makes no sense at all. Non sequiturs are, are, are in our daily lives, our jobs, and our relationships that people are always making statements that have nothing to do with what preceded it. And I find it fitting that as we come to the first Sunday after Good Resurrection Sunday, I was having a conversation with a young man recently, and we were talking about the events that surround the Holy Week. He said, yeah, y'all went to all those services last week. I mean, we were in church on Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, 
Thursday, Friday, y'all skipped Saturday. We got here early on Sunday, then drove to the Strathmore at 11 o'clock. I mean, we were in church all week long. This young man was asking me about what it means to have this and celebrate Holy Week. And I did the best explanation I could give to him. But after we finished talking, he said, yeah, I understand that Jesus got up, but what that got to do with me? He said, yeah, I understand that he got up on good Sunday morning with all power in his hands, but what that got to do with me? I don't want to correct his English. I appreciate the way he said it. And it's very real, raw and authentic. He said, I know Jesus got up, but what that got to do with me. And I know that's offensive to some of you all that are listening to me now because that messes up your Baptist in you because we know that we came all week long to sit in church to hear the preacher tell the story that one Friday they marched him from judgment hall to judgment hall. They put, put a crown of thorns on his head, pierced him in his side, put nails in his feet. He went in the grave on Friday, stayed there all Friday night, stayed there all Saturday, stayed there all Saturday night, but early I said early Sunday morning, he got up with, with all power in his hands, and that's all good and all, but this young man had a question, he said, what that got to do with me? You know, I, I think that that's literally, that's actually a, a, an important question that you and I wrestle with sometimes because uh, if you take your holy halo off uh, and you place it down so that your neighbor doesn't know the real you. You be honest that there are times in your life that when you know things about God, that doesn't match the way you feel about God. That yeah, Lord, I know you're a healer, but what that got to do with me? I, I know you can make a way, but what that got to do with me? I know you brought film out, but what that got to do with me? You see, oftentimes in our personal experiences, we are searching for the relevancy of the God that we serve. In other words, all of us can attest to the fact at some point in time in our lives, asking the very pressing question that this young man asks, what does that have to do with me? And I think we find ourselves in a very interesting position. When we come to John chapter 21, these disciples find themselves after crucifixion. Jesus has been crucified, buried, and resurrected from the grave. However, what are the implications for them? Yeah, Jesus got up, but what does that mean for them? Yeah, he got up from the grave, but what does that mean for them? I want to ask this question today, and I promise y'all I'm done, and I'll leave y'all be, but I just want to suggest that clarity about who Jesus is brings about hope that is manifested in a few ways. It's manifested in a way that we can reimagine our failures that then gives us advice to, for full circle moments that then gives us revelation that then fosters audacity. I'll give it to you one more time. You may be taking notes. That clarity about who Jesus is, it brings about a hope that manifests itself in a reimagination of our failures that then allows for full circle moments that can then give revelation that fosters Foster's audacity. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ have to do with you? It's very simple. There's always tomorrow. There's always a plan. And there's always more. That's my sermon in a sentence. What does Jesus have to do with you getting up on Sunday morning? All I came today was to tell you that there's always tomorrow. There's always a plan. And there's always more. Y'all didn't move, so I'm going to say it one more time. What does the resurrection communicate that there's always always tomorrow. There's always a plan and there's always more. As a matter of fact, I noticed what I said, that it brings about hope. Let the church shout hope. That that word hope in the Greek is an interesting word because it lends itself to concrete expectation. It means I expect concretely what's about to happen. And I know many of us have a diff there's a difference between wishing for something and hoping for something. Wishing for something 
doesn't have a foundation. But hoping for something always does. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of that old mother that went to that preacher after a three-night revival. The first night he preached, she went to him. She said, preacher, you hoped me on tonight. He said, yeah. I, he said, thank you, mother. I don't really know what that means, but God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow night. Second night came. He preached his heart out, and mother came to him after, afterwards and said, preacher, you hoped me on tonight. She he said, thank you, mother, again. I really appreciate it. Figure something might be wrong with mama. But then the third night comes back again and preaches his heart out, and mother came back to him and said the very same thing, that, that preacher, you hoped me on tonight. And then on that night, it was the last night, the preacher said, Mother, I got a question for you because the past three days, you've been telling me I hoped you tonight. She said, but don't you mean help you? Mother said, no, baby, I don't mean to help, hope, help. I meant hope. He said, well, Mother, what is the difference between helping you and hoping you? She looked that preacher in the, in the face and gave the best sermon that he had ever heard. She said, hope is what you hold on to until help shows up in your life. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but in the midst of your struggle, I'm trying to give you something to hold on to, that because Jesus got up, you and I always got hope in our life. Let me hurry. That's, that's where we see. In this, um, this uh, very familiar passage of Scripture, John paints this particular narrative at an interesting point. That John is different than the other writers, uh, writer, uh, other gospel writers, in it. That you remember the uh, the Gospel of Matthew begins in interesting fashion. Begins with the genealogy of Christ, showing us how Christ came from forty and two generations, showing how this is not just something, but God has had a plan all the time. The Gospel of Mark begins rather abruptly. It begins the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That we are ushered into a story that seems to be almost in continuation. And then there's Luke. Luke begins with his address that Theophilus saying that ultimately I have compiled all of this data almost like a historian to present this message unto you. But then there's old John. John begins in John chapter 1 saying in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I'd have you to know that John just doesn't begin differently than the other gospels. He also ends differently than the other gospels because this particular narrative that we are in today doesn't have, isn't found in any of the other Gospels. If you don't mind, come with me to the Sea of Tiberias, or rather the Sea of Galilee, as you probably know it to be. The disciples have now been on, have now come out of hiding because Jesus has gotten up from the grave. And sure, it's a typical day. They've been there before. I mean, they know this land pretty well. They know the terrain. They know the sea. They know how things go. They look at the temperature, and they decide that we are going to go back fishing. But notice how the text reads. It says, after this, Jesus revealed himself. And then the second verse says, and he revealed himself in this way. That that word in, that word in the Greek, reveal, it lends itself to shining or rather to bring into clarity. That before we even begin this passage, we are aware of the nature of it is to shine or to bring clarity to the disciples about who Jesus really is. And Peter has made a decision. Peter said, after all of this, I'm going fishing. And then the others, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John, and two other unnamed disciples, that Jesus reveals himself to these men. But don't you find this particularly interesting? Because you see, every year around this time, the disciples come under a lot of scrutiny. They are stained by two different scriptures. They are stained by Mark chapter 14, verse 50, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 56 that says then all the disciples deserted him and ran away that while Jesus is being crucified the disciples they run away while Jesus is being lynched the disciples the male disciples they run away but I got a question Alpha Shrita why did they run why did they run it's interesting that we always talk about the reality that they ran but nobody ever ask why? Why is it that they run? You see, there's very little evidence for the common practice of the crucifixion of women. It's very little evidence that we see supported. And to add to the point, it's 
generally is believed that these young men that while serving as apprentices of Jesus Christ are quite possibly teenagers. That means that if the oldest boy was 18 at the time of our text, he only would have been 21 years old. They were young men in fear for their lives and they ran. You see, do you and I do to the disciples what we typically do to black men on the regular when desiring to provide an explanation for some of their behavior? We reach for the lowest hanging fruit and you and I must be careful in our reaching for the lowest hanging fruit and the most accessible rationale because sometimes it can have dangerous implications because when we reach for the lowest hanging fruit, little boys get characterized as bad by the education system and placed into special education classes and get put on medicine which then funds pharmaceutical companies. When we reach for low hanging fruit, Baltimore will build a billion dollar jail that will be the most expensive state funded project in history. When we reach for low hanging fruit, teenage boys always struggle to see a picture of a man because there are financial incentives for the father not to be there. Sure of us, can, some of us can be upset at them for running, but all of us need to be careful to criticize circumstances that we don't even share. You, be, In other words, you be careful about running your mouth about people whose shoes you've never walked in. Ain't that the problem most of the time in church? You always got somebody saying something about what you went through and saying something about what you having to go through. But if they ever had to live 24 hours in your shoes, they'd be in somewhere in the hospital. Be careful how you criticize people. But hold on. This failure is not simply limited to their reputation. Look at it here. The text says that when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. Uh, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Uh, and, and Jesus raises the question. Let me tell y'all something. Sometimes, if, if, if it had been me, Jesus would have made me upset. I've been out here fishing all night long. And you come out of nowhere asking me, do you have any fish? No, man, what you mean? <laughs> now, Jesus says, do you have any fish? And I know because some of you are upset that, they're even, uh, that they are even fishing in the first place. Because you believe that they should have been out there saving souls for the kingdom. And I get it. But there's no evidence to suggest that, they were doing, that what they were doing was wrong. As a matter of fact, disciples have to eat. <laughs> hey, disciples have to eat. I know y'all holy. <laughs> I know you're spiritual. But you got to eat. Yeah, you, you got bills to pay. You got to go to work. You got to do, these are, these are mundane, routine things. And, and so they have to eat. But there are nothing. It's not necessarily a punishment. It's just a failure. H however, what if I told you that failure doesn't always have to be failure. Because I believe the gospel showcase that sometimes failure is just the beginning of what God is about to do. As a matter of fact, Raymond Brown notes here, he says that nothing is always the backdrop for God to work a miracle. If you look throughout the entire gospel, you will always find the disciples, they never catch fish unless Jesus is there. And maybe there's somebody here today, you feel as if nothing is your lot, that that's the hand that you have been and Jesus appears to these individuals in key fashion, I believe, for this reason, because he had told them earlier that apart from me, you can do nothing. And they are living, breathing examples of such that why would Jesus appear to such failures? And some of you remember that song, remember that movie? It was way before my time, 1977. It was this little redhead girl by the name of Annie. She was an orphan that grew up, that grew up in an orphanage that was being mistreated and Annie had a song that she would sing didn't she? She said the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that, that, that there'll be sun. Annie would go on singing that refrain. Tomorrow, tomorrow I love you. Tomorrow you're only a day away. Now Annie came out in 1977 and we thank God for Annie. Thank God for her ministry and how she's blessed people all over the world. But that ain't my Annie. As a matter of fact there's some Gen Z and 
millennials in here today that we have our own version of Annie. But listen, our Annie isn't white and our Annie doesn't have red hair. But she looks and talks a little different. She was born in Memphis, Tennessee. As a matter of fact, her name is Gloria Hallelujah Woods. She goes by the stage name of Glorilla. And as a matter of fact, Glorilla is new to the music scene, but she had a song that took off a while ago called Tomorrow. Now, let me pause here. I'm not telling any of y'all to go look up the lyrics. I will not be responsible if you go and listen to what Glorilla had to say. But the last song, the last line of the song by Glorilla says, every day the sun won't shine, but that's why I love tomorrow. And while she was preparing for a new album to come out, some of y'all remember about two weeks ago when she was on CNN and Glorilla gave me this and I said, I can't wait to tell Alfred Street this. She said, at the end of the day, the day got to end. And that's all I came to tell somebody here today. If you going through failure in your life, it's got to end. If you going through struggle in your life, at the end of the day, the day got to end. Grieving right now, at the end of the day, the day got to end. Why don't you touch your neighbor beside you and say, it's got an expiration day on it. And trouble don't last always. Look at somebody and say, it's got to end. It's, it's got, I know it hurts right now, but it's got to end. I, I know it's painful right now, but it's got to end. As a matter of fact, can we take time, take about 10 seconds and give God the best praise? Because we know that what I'm going through, it's got to end sometime. I'm, I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. I'm moving, I'm moving. Um, it guarantees that a resurrected Jesus guarantees that there's always a tomorrow. Uh, wait, wait, but the, the, a resurrected Jesus guarantees that there's always a plan. Um, I, I need to show you that there are a few elements that, that need to be pointed out here. Note some of the uh, notable characteristics of the narrative. They are on the Sea of Tiberias, uh, uh, or rather the Sea of Galilee. They're on the Sea of Galilee, Fishing, when they can't catch a thing, Jesus shows up and they catch fish. That's the story. See a galley trying to fish. Can't catch a thing. Mr. Jesus shows up, gives some instructions, and then ultimately they catch fish. Um, um, I, I would tell you, you Bible readers would know that this story, sounds very similar to what happens in Luke chapter 5. That they are on the same sea, doing the same thing with the same results. And Jesus shows up, and then they're able to catch fish. Now, 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 now this is a, is a resurrection appearance in John, and it's placed at the end of the gospel. But in Luke's gospel, it happens at the beginning of, of the gospel. And it's the place that the disciples were called into ministry. Uh, it's interesting because uh, this is the only resurrection appearance, y'all, that happens in Galilee. All of the other resurrection appearances happen in Judea, but this is the only one that occurs in, in Galilee. As a matter of fact, it forms a full circle moment to what the angel said to, said to the women in, in the, at, at, the end of, at the end of Mark when it says uh, he is going ahead of you, not to Judea, but to Galilee. It's a, it's a, it's a full circle moment. All of us know something about full circle moments, don't we? That they communicate something to us that on Good Friday, like many of you, I was in here, and I was uh, listening and, and, and participating in our service, Sisters at the Cross. While we were in service, there was another sister that was crossing over into another genre. Uh, uh, Beyonce released her famous, infamous I, I, uh, album, um, Cowboy Carter. Uh, on that album, uh, Beyonce has a song entitled Blackbird. And the lyrics say, Blackbird singing in the dead of night. That these broken wings, take these broken wings and, and learn how, how to fly. You are waiting for this moment to arise. I, I'd have you to know that those words are not original to Beyonce. A, as a matter of fact, they were originally penned 
by Paul McCartney, who wrote the song in 1968 for the Beatles. Now, at the time, he had looked at what was happening in the civil rights movement and then took notice of the Little Rock Nine and was, and was inspired by that movement and then penned the lyrics to, penned the lyrics to Blackbird. Blackbird, uh, Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. That literally, the black bird that he's referring to is black little girls. He didn't know that 56 years later, a black girl would be singing the song that he wrote for some other black girls and then produce it so that the whole world can see it again. It's a full circle moment. But I know something about full circle moments. You see, my brothers and sisters, I get the question even just this week. Ty, how in the world did you end up at Alfred Street? I'll give y'all the Cliff Notes version, and I'll give it to you the rest of you a little bit later. You see, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Around 2017, I graduated I graduated from seminary, and then from there, I went and took my first staff position in Miami, Florida. I was there. I mean, from Waco to Miami, Florida, I'm talking about it was great I mean you couldn't imagine how life was moving to Miami Florida and then ultimately I'm working down there as a youth and young adult pastor while I'm there things are going okay I'm doing doing my thing trying to do the best that I can but then I remember some things started getting a little shaky and I sensed some things weren't going that well and then ultimately I remember the day like it was yesterday it was March 22nd of 2019 I went into the office with the expectation to talk about the, the furtherance of the ministry and the plans that I had and I was met with some information that, that startled me and, and wrecked the rest of my life. I was told, Ty, we are going in a different direction. And I raised the question, what is it? Why is it that you're deciding to go in a different direction? I was given three reasons. You're ineffective, you got bad work ethic, and you don't fit here. I said, are you serious? He said, you're ineffective, you got bad work ethic and you don't fit here. I mean, I had, I, I got to tell y'all something. I struggled in a major way because there I am in Miami, Florida. I'm not from there. I'm all, all the way 15 and some hours away from home. I'm there all by myself. That sometimes the only reason I was able to eat was because my best friend at a restaurant and would call me sometimes to feed me. My lights got cut off. My car got taken away. I was sitting there in Miami for months on months praying that some kind of way I would be able to make ends meet. I ultimately had to move back home, suffering from depression, began therapy, trying to leave, leave myself of this heaviness, trying to get away from what I was struggling with because I couldn't understand how is it that good black church people that would shout when I would preach would turn around and talk bad about me in meetings when I wasn't there. How was it that the same people whose, whose children I went to go see and whose children I went and had counsel with would turn around and and have these things to say about me. A dime went on. I ended up having to be forced to move back to Memphis, Tennessee. I was there for a time trying to get my life together. But I have you to know, you asked me how I got to Alpha Street. I got to be honest, I had no interest in coming here. Because, because of my experiences, I did not trust working on another staff again. I said, no, I'm, not, I'm good. I don't, have, I don't need to be there. They'll figure something out. But then I remember I started having conversations. We started talking. We started talking about what the job uh, would look like. And then I remember this day like it was yesterday. I was fired on March 22nd, 22nd of 2019. But then it was March 22nd of 2022. I was in the gym with my brothers working out. I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. On the other end of that phone call was Howard John Wesley. Howard John Wesley said, hey Ty, thank you for accepting my call. He began to talk about the job description and what we think potentially could happen if I came to Alpha Street. And what he didn't know was, he said, after looking at everything, he said, Ty, I think you would be a perfect fit. I said, hold on a second. He doesn't know, but I, I end up crying the rest of the call because just three years later to the date, I was fired because I didn't fit. Only three years later to receive a call at the same time to be told that you fit. I'm trying to tell somebody that that's a full circle 
moment, that full circle moments give revelation that, that ultimately tells you that you'll be able to keep on going. I'm trying to tell somebody here today that full circle moments, they demonstrate the sovereignty of God. They demonstrate the providence of the God that we serve. And I know it may be rough right now, but God will sometimes show you in a full circle moment, I've been working all the time. I had a plan all the, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you hope and a future. I'm trying to tell you today, God's got a plan for your life. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, he's got a plan. He's got a, he's got a plan. He's got a, he's got a plan. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. You, you, you'll be able. You'll be able to make it to your one o'clock brunch. I promise. I'm done. Um. Um. The revelation. There's a revelation that happens. Um, John, the beloved disciple, gives a word. Hey, hey, we, we, we're trying to fish. Um, we, we ain't got none. Somebody shows up 100 yards away. Hey, do y'all have any fish? Uh, um, and, 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 and he says, cast your nets on, on the right side. And ca cast them on the right side. And when you cast them on the right side, uh, ultimately, you, you'll get some fish. It, it's interesting um, because they, they come out because night fishing is more opportune. As a matter of fact, night fishing is more profitable on the Sea of Galilee because if you fish at night, it gives you a head start on being able to produce fish for the market in the next morning. They came out at nighttime because they believed that they were doing their best. They were being profitable. They were being strategic and smart and coming out. And Jesus says, do you have any fish? But, but, they, but they caught nothing. Throw your nets on the side, on the right side, a simple instruction. But when they're obedient, they, they, they then are able to get some fish. Isn't it interesting that when you and I obey the strange request of God, some kind of way, things have a way of working out. Cast your nets on, on the right side. And, and John the Beloved then shouts out, that's the Lord. That's, that's the Lord. And he says to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, the text says he tied his, his outer clothing around him and, and jumped into the sea. I'm done, y'all. Um, John tells him it's the Lord. He ties his outer clothing around him and then jumps into the sea. I have you to know that all throughout the Gospels, anytime you see Jesus... Peter, and water, there's always revelation. Anytime you see Jesus, Peter, and, and water, there's always some revelation to, to be gained. That Jesus often took those times to reveal himself not only to Peter, but also to the rest of the disciples. Um, that Here it is. He says, it is the Lord. I realize. He says, Peter says, it's the Lord. And while he isn't the first to recognize Jesus, he is the first to act on the revelation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had to ask Pete. Uh, I said, Pete, wait a minute. Uh, here it is, you on the boat. And, and John says, that's the Lord. You, you don't hesitate. Uh, uh, you, 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 don't, you don't take a minute to pull some fish into the, pull some fish into the boat. You just jump. Into the lake. Uh, Pete, Pete, why, why, why would you do such a thing? Well, Todd, this ain't the first time I've been in this type of position. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 6, I was there on the Sea of Galilee, and we were caught up in a storm, and everything was going haywire. We thought uh, we were about to lose our lives. And then ultimately, what happens is, is that Jesus comes walking on the water in the fourth watch of the night and says, take courage, it is I, which in Greek says, I am. And I said, Rabbi, if that's you, do me a favor and let me come and walk out on the water to you. And then Jesus gives an invitation to me that I have never forgotten for the rest of my life. 
life, Jesus reaches out his hands and says, come to me. I got out on that water and I began to walk and I began to do something that nobody else had ever been able to do. He said, because what you have to understand, Ty, is, is that any time you know who Jesus is, it gives you the audacity to do things that others haven't been able to do. I'm trying to tell somebody, I'm coming to your house today. If you know who Jesus is, it ought to give you the audacity, the unmitigated goal to walk on water while others are still in the boat. It ought to give you the audacity to go and launch the business. It ought to give you the audacity to launch the YouTube page. It ought to give you the audacity to file for the grant. It ought to give you the audacity to go back to school. It ought to give you the audacity to fill out the application when you know who Jesus is. It gives you the audacity to do things that others can't do. I'm coming. I'm coming around. But I'm done. Oh, but, but here it is. Peter, he may not be the first to know, but he is the first to ask. This in the end for Peter. <laughs> it's in the end for Peter. As a matter of fact, because of this revelation, it's the Lord. Uh, that's going to be in the book of Acts. Peter's going to preach a sermon. And the content of his message is that Jesus is Lord. And 3,000 people are going to come to know the Lord. I'm saying, when you know who Jesus is, it gives you courage and audacity to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. I'm done. But that's essentially what happens every time you and I uh, come into church. Every time you and I uh, are, in the, are in the good sanctuary, um, that we have the audacity. To say God is good, even when things feel bad. We have the audacity to say God's going to make a way, even when we can't even see the way. We have the audacity to say God is a provider when our income doesn't, it doesn't seem to be making sense. We have the audacity to believe that ultimately God is going to bring a child back home. We have the audacity to believe that ultimately God is a healer. We have an audacity to believe that this, that this earthly temple, although it will dissolve, we've got another building not made. We've got the audacity. I, I, I tell you, because when you know who Jesus is, he comes with audacity. The other day, I'm tell, I'm done. The other day, that's the seventh time. I'm a, I'm a black preacher. That's what we do. That's, yeah. Get used to it. Y'all be all right. I'm done. Paul, three days ago, three days ago, I'm, I, I was on Instagram Live. I'm on Instagram Live uh, because I was talking about our 75 hard challenge that, that, that we're doing. And I was on there and I was talking and giving and telling people that, hey, man, y'all got y'all to gotta be a part of this. It's going to be dope. It's going to be a good time. Make sure you hop, uh, make sure that you sign up for the uh, 75 hard challenge. While I'm on there, I'm telling them that ultimately, um, uh, I'm telling them that ultimately um, that I'm at a new gym today, that I've never been to this gym before, that I, I typically uh, go to one gym, but I made the decision that I was going to go to another gym because I just wanted something different on that particular day. While I'm on the gym, while I'm, at, while I'm on Instagram Live, I tell them, I say, hey, I'm at Lifetime Fitness right now. Now, pause here for a moment. If any of you all know anything about gym memberships, you know that there, are, there is Lifetime prices and then there are other gym prices. So much so that, so much so that one of my friends on, on, the, uh, on Instagram Live, her name is Kai. She comes to Kaya sometimes. She says, oh, you had Instagram, you, you, you had lifetime fitness, that means that you got money. That means that you, 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 you able to afford a lifetime membership. I said, hold on, sweetheart. Hold on one second. I need to tell you something. Ty does not have any money. I said, but Robert Jones does have money. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, Ty doesn't, can afford a lifetime membership, but Robert C. Jones in Memphis, Tennessee can afford a lifetime membership. I said, listen, the only reason I'm able to be in lifetime is because when I walk up to the counter, because my father and I share the same name, I 
I scan my card and his account pops up. And so whenever they are looking at allow me in, my dad's account pops up and that gives me access to their sauna. That give me access to their jacuzzi. It give me access to, the, to their treadmills. They stair masters and everything else and their tiles. I get to be in there just like everybody else because my account is linked to my father. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May God bless y'all real good. But that's all I came today to tell somebody. You ain't got to worry about a thing. Because as long as Jesus makes things work in your life, I, yeah, everything is going to be all right. Would you do me a favor and, 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 and grab your neighbor by the hand? I feel like having church markers. Give me everything. Say, neighbor. To help you get through the rest of the week, weeping may endure for the night, but joy is gonna come in the morning. Bye bye now, y'all. I gotta let y'all go, but I only want you to know that you got a tomorrow, that God's got a plan, and this ain't the end of your story. That because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, because Jesus lives, I'm done now, y'all. Thank y'all for letting me share. I promise I wouldn't be too long, but can y'all help me one more time? Turn! I said turn! Turn! I said, turn. Y'all ain't turning. I said, turn. Turn to your neighbor and grab that neighbor by the hand. Rock that neighbor and shake that neighbor. Rock. Rock that neighbor. Shake. Shake that neighbor and that neighbor. The reason why I look the way I look. The and why I have what I have is because it's not my account. It's the Lord. Lord have mercy. Grab somebody one time. If God's been good to you, lift your hands in the air. Shout yes. Lord. Shout yes. I think I almost feel good. Do y'all know why we're shouting? Do you know why we're praising? I know it's the Sunday after Easter, but I might as well tell the story. It was one Friday. They put him on the cross. They put a spear in his side. He said, if you think I'll fight you, nail my hands. If you think I'll run, nail my feet. They hung him high, stretched him wide. He dropped his head, and then he died. If my daddy was here, he'd say he died until the sun refused to shine. He died until the moon dripped away in blood. He died until the S-O-N went out. S-U-N went out, and the S-O-N came out. He died until the earth reeled and rocked like a drunken man. But you and I know that that ain't the end, that ain't the end of the story, because early, I said early Sunday morning, I need you to put your Baptist voice on, shout early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand, and if he got up, you can get up, if he got up, you can get up, do me one favor,
think it's a good place to give God praise? Come on, Marcus, cut that click check up. I think that's a good place to give God some praise. On the count of three, we gonna give God the best praise we can give him. One, two, one, two, three, two, three, give it to him. somebody here today um, there's somebody here today you wondering why why your neighbor doing all that shouting and all that yelling and all that stuff it's because we know that Jesus got up and got up and 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 here's the thing if your problem isn't bigger than a dead Jesus that means that he can handle it. So listen, I, I, I don't, we don't want to skip this moment. The deacons are going to come now. Listen, um, the heart of Alpha Street is open at this time. That, that, that's somebody here. You, you're looking to be in relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and we, we, we want you to come now. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't, don't, don't listen. We with you. This is your family. We want you to come. We, we want you to come. Wherever you are, I don't care where you are, come, come wherever you are. Because... You, you don't know me, I don't know you. And, and you saying, how he know all my business? Come on. Y'all can do better than that, come on. Yeah, 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 come on. Come on, somebody, somebody else. Oh my. Come on, somebody else. Oh, for Christ. Oh my, sister. oh, my sister, I'm trying to tell you, he will give you, he will give you brand new life. not just any life, but life come on, do yourself a favor oh, right now. Come on. come on, come on to Christ. We're going to sing it one time. We waiting on you, come on. We waiting on you, come on. We waiting on you. We
give you a living testimony. He will. to Christ. Alpha Street, will you do me a favor and give God praise for the two that have decided to come. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Whoa. So yeah, that's the end. Um, if you made it all the way here, then you are a real one and I owe you big time. So thank you uh, so very much. And uh, like I said, I'm going to try to do my best to bring uh, some more sermons here. Um, I got a whole lot in the backlog. I just need to upload them. So I appreciate you rocking with me. Let me know your thoughts. Comment, share it with somebody else, and make sure you subscribe. And I'll see y'all next time. Living Purpose on Purpose.